You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Your host for Heart Matters is Dr. Janet Wright, Senior Vice President for Science and Quality for the American College of Cardiology. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, or CRT, is strongly recommended for patients with moderate to severe heart failure and a prolonged QRS interval. Can prophylactic resynchronization therapy delivered by an implantable defibrillator reduce the risk of decompensation or death in those patients with mild heart failure? New data likely brings us closer to the answer. Our guest today is Dr. Arthur Moss, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Heart Research Follow-Up Program at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry in Rochester, New York. Welcome, Dr. Moss. I appreciate the interview, Dr. Wright. I think we might start with a description for our audience of CRT. Yes, well, let me put this in perspective. The original device treatment with cardiac patients was the implantable cardiac defibrillator, the ICD. And the same people who developed that technique, Drs. Murawski and Maurer, in the 1970s and early 80s, also developed the what's called cardiac resynchronization therapy. And their background uh, thinking was that they were aware that when patients were paced from the right ventricle with a pacemaker and produced a what we call a left bundle branch block pattern that if they could pace that when that occurred it impaired the heart's function it produced what we call dyssynchrony and they found that if they could pace the left ventricle rather than the right ventricle in animals that this would dramatically prevent the compromise of the heart's contraction So what they proposed was stimulating the left ventricle in patients with heart failure, and that was cardiac resynchronization therapy that's now a guideline-approved technique for patients in New York heart class 3 and 4 advanced heart failure and a wide QRS complex like a left bundle branch block pattern. And this is associated with very significant improvement in the heart's function. So what we wanted to do was to see if we could take patients who had heart disease, coronary, ischemic or non-ischemic heart disease, and a wide QRS complex, that is the QRS duration on the electrocardiogram being prolonged, and if they were relatively free of symptoms, that is in New York Heart Association class one or two, very minimal symptoms if any, and to see if cardiac resynchronization therapy would prevent the development of heart failure or death, whichever came first. And the technique for doing cardiac resynchronization and pacing the left ventricle, it really just uses a catheter, very similar to what's used in standard regular pacing, but the catheter is positioned through the coronary vein, the coronary sinus, and then into the coronary vein, and then down the left ventricular vein, so that in fact, one's pacing the left ventricle from the epicardium or just outside the heart. And so this is the technique that we studied, and that is, can cardiac resynchronization prevent the development of heart failure in at-risk patients with heart disease, but who are not yet symptomatic or only minimally symptomatic, but have not had advanced heart failure. Let's talk more about that. Now, the trial was called MADIT CRT. Right. So that's the Multi Center Automatic Defibrillator Implantation Trial with CRT. Tell us more about that trial. Yes. Well, first, let me say that we only took patients who qualified for an implanted defibrillator according to guidelines. And so the guidelines include patients with an ejection fraction of less than or equal to 30% and having either coronary or ischemic or non-ischemic heart disease. So this was the entry. And so therefore, all the patients got an ICD and patients were randomized to an ICD only or to an ICD with cardiac resynchronization therapy because they are now the devices that contain both of these. So the only difference between the two arms of the trial was that one group had the addition of resynchronization therapy and the other did not. And then we implanted this in 1,820 patients, randomized to the two groups, and the primary endpoint was heart failure or death 
whichever comes first during this follow-up. So the 1,820 patients were followed on average for about two and a half years, the longest being four and a half years and the shortest being a little over a year. So the overall average length of follow-up was about two and a half years. And the primary findings were, in essence, a 34% reduction in the primary endpoint. That is, the patients who received the CRT had 34% fewer heart failure or death events. This was highly significant at a significance level of P less than 0.001. And when we looked at this, this was dominated by reduction in heart failure events. The mortality rate was very low in both groups because both groups had an ICD and were in New York heart class one and two. So the mortality rate was less than 3% per year in both groups. And that's almost impossible to beat. That's a very low mortality rate as opposed to most of the ICD trials are in the range of around 5 to 6% per year or even more, maybe 7% per year. So what we found was a dramatic reduction in heart failure events. How do you account for such a dramatic drop in the risk of heart failure events? Well, we were fortunate in that we obtained echocardiograms at baseline and one year in the patients, and we looked at whether there was any change in the size of the heart. We measure this by recording the dimensions of the heart, the what we call the left ventricular end diastolic volume and the left ventricular end systolic volume, and we also look at the left ventricular ejection fraction. And in each case, in the patients who received benefit, there was dramatic reduction in the size of the heart. That is, the heart came back almost to normal size in terms of its end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, and the ejection fraction increased by 11 units. That is, we measure ejection fraction in percent of how much of the heart, how much blood is ejected with each heartbeat. Normally, it's about 60% or so, and the patients who were enrolled in this study were all less than or equal to 30%, and we had, on average, an 11-unit absolute unit increase in the ejection fraction. So we feel the reduction in heart volume and the improvement in the ejection fraction explain the dramatic benefit. One additional point is that when we looked at subgroups in this population, we found it very interesting that the women received a much better benefit than the men. The men had a significant benefit. They had about a 30% benefit reduction in events, but the women had something like a 70% reduction in events. So it looked like this resynchronization therapy is the first therapy that is associated with meaningfully better results in women than men. And this is something that uh, the American Heart Association is interested in and other groups. This is the first time that there is a therapy that has been more effective in women than men, and this was also associated with a greater improvement in the echocardiographic findings. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Wright. Our guest today is Dr. Arthur Moss, professor of medicine and director of the Heart Research Follow-Up Program at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry in Rochester, New York. We're discussing the role of cardiac resynchronization in the prevention of heart failure. Arthur, these results are stunning, and you were just describing the additional benefit that women saw in this treatment compared to men, even though men's benefit was also significant. What else did you learn from subgroup analysis, as dangerous as those are? Well, these were all pre-specified. That is, the Mm -hmm. way this trial was structured and designed was not only for the primary endpoint, it was pre-specified, but we also pre-specified 10 subgroup analyses as well as their cut points. And so, for example, we found a similar benefit in younger patients versus older patients, in those patients with ischemic and non-ischemic heart disease, 
those patients receiving beta blockers and not receiving beta blockers, although almost all the patients were receiving beta blockers and were on optimal medical therapy. The only thing, in addition to the women issue, where the women got a better result, we also found that the patients with the wider QRS complex also got a better result, significantly better result than the patients with the narrower QRS complex. So it does appear that the degree of what we refer to as dyssynchrony or poor contraction of the heart is intimately related to the length of the QRS complex and that the longer the QRS complex, the wider it is, the better the benefit from resynchronization therapy. So this was the other aspect that we found in the primary trial. In my career, I was always struck by the difference in symptoms of patients with similar ejection fractions, or said a different way, patients with different ejection fractions could have similar symptom levels. And in your study, you had patients with ejection fractions of less than or equal to 30%, and yet they were not remarkably symptomatic. Any wisdom you'd like to share with the audience about that? We caught these patients earlier and intervened earlier in a preventive sense. If you allow these patients to get to class 3 or class 4, then you're treating established heart failure, and that's what has been previously approved with cardiac resynchronization therapy. So our emphasis is in the prevention of heart failure in patients with advanced heart disease. Oh, and what a wonderful direction this is taking. You've provided evidence that prevention in heart failure is feasible and can be successful or effective. So let's get down to advice for those folks in our audience who are taking care of patients with heart failure. Give us the sort of one, two, three of what you would have clinicians do differently as a result of the knowledge from this study. The information will be independently presented to the Food and Drug Administration for them to make a a decision on this. The chances are they will make a favorable decision because there is another trial considerably smaller called REVERSE that found exactly the same echo findings that is a reduction in heart volumes and an improvement in ejection fraction between baseline and one year in virtually the same group of patients. So now one has two studies showing essentially the same findings, but with our study, a much larger study, having very precise endpoints of heart failure or death, whichever comes first, and that endpoint was met. So I think that the idea is that the treatment for these patients should wait until guidelines and FDA approval. We expect an FDA approval before the end of the year, and there will be a presentation to the FDA shortly. So until that comes out, it's difficult for us to make this recommendation because it would be a new indication, and we do think it should be looked at very carefully by the FDA and let them review all of our data. We don't think there is a problem. We've published this in the New England Journal of Medicine, and there was very, very careful scrutiny at that time, and so we don't expect there to be any particular problem with the FDA, but I think there's no problem in waiting a few additional months until we get the formal approval for this therapy. And then what we would recommend is that the patients who have a low ejection fraction, that's less than 30%, less than or equal to 30%, and have a QRS complex of uh, the FDA will decide whether one wants to use 120 or 130 milliseconds. Once that's approved, we do think that cardiac resynchronization will play a significant role in reducing hospitalizations and reducing overall costs over the period of time, not just the time in the trial that we've had of two and a half years or so, but also over a much longer period of time which we are actively following. Well, we will stay tuned with you, and our audience will as well, to the decision made at the FDA. We've been talking with Dr. Arthur Moss about the role of cardiac resynchronization in the prevention of heart failure. Dr. Moss, thank you for being our guest today. Well, thank you, Janet. It's been a pleasure, and you asked some very appropriate questions. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast of this segment, 
please visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.